questions, please do not name the uh, my function host presentation because <laughs> that would create a, a certain classification issue. Uh, so put your name there. And uh, it's PDF, PowerPoint, and uh, keynote here. So whatever takes uh, your fancy. Okay. All right, um, welcome to my talk. Um, today I'll be talking a little bit about annotation of protein binding residues in protein sequences. Uh, the problem, the oh, uh, so can you hear me from here? Yeah, but, but you're being recorded. Oh, okay. I'm being recorded. Okay, that's too bad. Because I like to move a lot, so now I'm constrained to just the podium. Um, all right, so. Um, um, I'll, I'm going to introduce our new tool called Scriber. Uh, that tool essentially takes a protein sequence and will annotate protein binding residues in the sequence. So the functional annotation that we're dealing with is at the residue level. <clears throat> um, maybe perhaps uh, the confusing part in that title is the partner type specific prediction. Um, it's at the very coarse grain level partner specific prediction, which means it's a protein partner specific prediction. We are not going to be able to tell you uh, the exact pair of proteins that interact. We are still going to be able to only tell you uh, the protein binding residues in a protein sequence. Uh, and I'm, trying, I'm, I'm going to show you that even that is quite difficult. Um, this work was done with my uh, former um, visiting PhD student, Jian Zhang. Uh, who is right now a faculty in Shenzhen Normal University. <clears throat> uh, so um, I'll start by saying uh, why would we do that? Um, um, it, it was great to have the talk right before me that said the obvious thing, most of the proteins are not functionally annotated. Um, and that kind of a coarse-grained annotation of protein binding residues is actually useful. Um, uh, because it will tell you which residues in a sequence are functional. And uh, one immediate application is essentially to use this information to guide protein-protein or protein-peptide docking. Um, uh, a couple of years ago, we've published a survey um, on that topic, and we found that there's about 16 methods that already do that. Uh, first of those methods was published over a decade ago in 2007. Um, the newest at that time was that method from 2016. And I've highlighted a few of these methods in blue. Those are the methods that we'll eventually compare with. Those are the methods which are still publicly available and uh, reasonably well predicting um, um, in, in this area. <clears throat> so the first thing that we've, we've done um, at that point was uh, to ask a question, um, should we actually do that. So the survey that we've done, uh, the, the point there was to evaluate these tools, comparatively evaluate these tools, and figure out whether there's a need for another tool. And what we found is two things. Uh, number one, uh, prediction of protein binding residues is, is more difficult than the prediction of other types of binding ligands. So if you want to identify uh, nucleic acid interacting residues, that's actually much easier. Uh, this comparatively is a much harder problem. So what we've done is we've sampled uh, a few representative tools that can predict RNA or DNA binding residues versus protein binding residues, and you can see the dif differential in the predictive quality. You can actually find DNA binding residues with AUCs at around 0.8. The RNA binding residues there, uh, the RNAs are much more structurally diverse. Uh, this is probably why the accuracy goes down to about 0.7, and for protein binding residues, the accuracy goes down to about AUC of point, high 0.6. So this is a much more challenging problem uh, that we've decided to attack. The other reason why we've decided to re-attack this problem is that these tools actually don't do what they advertise they do. And I'll, I'll try to show that with this slide. This is um, a spider plot that is five-dimensional. So what we've done is we've looked at predictions from the protein binding residue predictors, and we've assessed their um, precision when you use them on a data set annotated with, other, um, with, with binding to other ligands. So uh, you have five dimensions. The top dimension is essentially sensitivity when you score these methods on prediction of protein binding residues. And then uh, we calibrated all these tools to the same prediction rate, meaning we actually predicted the correct number of protein binding residues. That doesn't mean all these predictions were correct. About a third of them was correct. And then the other dimensions look at other types of ligand binding residues. Uh, the DNA binding residues, the RNA binding residues, the other small ligand binding residues, and then eventually non-binding residues. And if you look at these dimensions, um, the prediction rate 
for any type of a binding residue is the same. And these tools are advertised as protein binding residue predictors. And they don't do that. You essentially are going to get a prediction of a binding residue, no matter what this binding residue uh, interacts with. Uh, so the prediction rate for DNA binding residues is actually higher than the protein binding residues for RNA binding residues in, is in, in, is in the same range at about 20 to 30 percent. <clears throat> um, you could ask why. And my simple explanation to why these tools are nonspecific is because they were built using wrong data sets. When you build these tools, you use protein binding data sets, and you actually ignore other types of protein sequences. You don't have that negative set of uh, residues that bind to other ligands in your training set. If you don't have it, then the optimizer is not going to be able, the optimizer that you do, whatever algorithm that you are going to do, is not going to be able to distinguish between all these different types of positives. So this is, a, I, I have called it a major flaw, a fatal flaw, because these methods don't really do what they are advertised to do. <clears throat> so um, the first thing that we've done a couple of years back was to develop a proper data set. And what I mean by that is that data set has to have a few, few key features. Number one, it has to actually include proteins that bind to multiple different ligands. So we had a collection of, like a mixed collection of proteins that bind other proteins, that bind DNA and RNA, and some other small ligands. So we have a proper set of now difficult binding residues. Uh, number two, we've made sure that we clean up the way that these data sets were created in the past. In the past, what would happen is you create those sets out of um, complex uh, structures from PDB. And the way people would do it is we'll take a complex and we'll take a corresponding sequence annotated with binding residues and put it into a data set. The truth is that when you do that, on the top of it, you will reduce identity of these sequences from PDB. And what that inevitably does is um, it selects a single chain that interacts with the same molecule out of the collection or a cluster of chains. While in fact, these, oftentimes these interactions are different uh, for the same chain. So what we've done instead is we've mapped every single structure, uh, um, every single sequence of, of a complex in a structure into the same um, uniprot sequence, uh, multiplying in a way the annotations. Uh, so our data set is more complete, uh, in order of about 30% more annotations that we include by using multiple complex structures on the same chain. Number three, what we've done is we've actually uh, made an effort to make all these predictions and assessments of full, on full protein chains. So we don't use PDB fragments, everything is mapped to a full protein chain. Of course, we are going to be able to do assessment only on parts of the chain that have annotations, but we still uh, maintain uh, integrity of the entire chain when we make predictions. And it's um, very important, particularly when you want to generate inputs to a predictor, because the, these inputs come from a full protein chain. Uh, number three, uh, n number four, I guess, um, oh, our data set is much larger. And, and I'm not going to take a credit why it's much larger. The simple explanation is we've used newer data. We've used newer PDB, therefore we have more data. Um, and the increase is in about two folds compared to all the training sets used in the past. And we took, lastly, we took our data set and we split it into two parts, one for training, one for testing, and we've made sure that the testing part is dissimilar at a 25% level to our training set and training sets of all the methods that we um, test against. So it's a fair test set. So with the, this new data set in hand, we've decided to design a method. Um, and there's a... Um, oh, that's a summary of the data set. The training and the test set, you can see the size, about 1,300 proteins that we had in the set, two-thirds, <clears throat> sorry, two-thirds in the training set, one-third in the test set, and you can see the breakdown of different types of binding residues in that set. So we have a complete coverage of all different ligands here. All right, so the next thing that we've done is we set out to build a predictive model. Um, I'm not a Big believer in deep neural networks. I like shallow solutions, but I'm very happy to um, had my um, the previous speaker uh, say good things about logistic regression. That's my favorite tool, and I will stick to that tool. So you're not going to hear about uh, um, embedding. You're not going to hear about neural networks. You're going to hear a 
about a very simple model that relies on logistic regression. Um, what that also means is you have to be really smart how you design that model. <clears throat> so there's a couple of things that we've set out with to make sure that our model could be successful. And what I mean by successful is it has to be more accurate than pre previous models, and at the same time, we have to clean up this cross-prediction issue. So we have to be really partner-specific. When we, when we say we predict protein-binding residues, we actually do predict specifically protein-binding residues, and we exclude prediction of other types of interactions. <clears throat> so uh, our model has like three steps. So step one is we produce a sequence profile. So we take a sequence and we produce sequence-derived information that then will be fed into those logistic regression models. And we've set out to build a quite comprehensive profile. Anything that comes to your mind, essentially, which is relevant to uh, a prediction of protein binding residues. So what we've done is we've designed a specific index of amino acid propensity for protein binding. That's the very first line. Then we've got um, solvent accessibility, predicted solvent accessibility, which obviously is important. Then we've looked at um, <clears throat> the um, uh, alignments, uh, I mean, um, um, alignment scores. Uh, we've also looked at the disordered protein binding uh, sites, a secondary structure, and some selected physiochemical properties of the amino acids that are relevant to protein binding. Um, the very last line, which is listed there, I call it combined features. This is something that we need to do by hand if we are to use logistic regression. So we've used combination of this information. We would, for instance, look for uh, conserved residues on predicted surface or conserved residues for specific secondary structures. So these combinational features have to be handcrafted because reg regression cannot do that. If I would be feeding that into a neural network, neural network will do it magically by itself. I can't, I, I'm, again, I'm a firm believer in simpler models. This is why we had to handcraft those features. And we ended up handcrafting about 1,000 features. Uh, the second step in the model is essentially um, a prediction of binding residues. Uh, what we've done is we've predicted five types of, pro uh, five types of binding residues, including residues that bind RNA, DNA, small ligands, proteins, and then anything that is a non-protein binding residue but is a binding residue. So we've created five models with a singular purpose in mind. We are going to use one of these models. We are going to refine protein binding uh, prediction with uh, the other four predictions. Uh, so this is what happens in the second layer. We refine the prediction of protein binding residues with the other four predictions, essentially reducing scores for predictions which are non-protein binding specific. Um, we've done an ablation analysis when we've dropped particular parts of our model. So we've dropped additional inputs that were not used in the past. We've dropped the second layer, or we've dropped uh, the combination inputs. And we show with this graph that all these um, design-specific features of our model contribute to the predictive performance. What you see here is the blue bars is the AUC. So as we add more elements to our model, AUC goes up. And the pink line is the cross-prediction rate, the rate of prediction of the wrong type of residues, and that goes down. At the end of the day, this big table is supposed to show comparison of our model, which is at the bottom, with the other models. And we break down the comparison on three aspects. The aspect in the pink, is the binary prediction, so whether or not a given, it's a crisp prediction of protein binding residues. And this is done at the correct rate of prediction. And you can see our sensitivity is a little bit higher. Then uh, the green part is the propensities. We assess propensities for, for protein binding, and we do that with a standard um, AUC, and then also area under a precision recall curve. And again, the results are a little bit better. The big improvement is in the cross-prediction rate. So what we've done, the very last line is the cross-prediction rate. So it's a crisp cross-prediction uh, percentage. So in this case, we cross-predict about 11% of residues compared to about 34% of the correct predictions. So the balancing is much better than for any other model. And the other score that we have is, is the area under the cross-prediction rate, which I'm going to show in the next slide. <clears throat> so these are the... Three types of curves, the ROC curves, the precision recall curves, and the cross-prediction rates, where we vary cross-prediction against the sensitivity. So in, in the last case, the smaller the area, the better, because you do fewer cross-predictions. And you can see the type of an improvements that we get. And the funny thing is, for a lot of methods in, in this plot, 
uh, you can see that these lines are above the diagonal, which is really bad, which means essentially you do more predictions of other types of uh, binding residues than compared to protein binding residues. Uh, so the, I'm, I'm going to back to my um, spider plot from the beginning, and the uh, uh, line in the middle is the new method. You can see that we've cleaned up uh, small ligand binding, we've cleaned up DNA binding. We have some trouble with RNA binding residues. They are much more difficult to differentiate from protein binding residues, but the rate is quite favorable still. We can predict twice as many protein binding residues. So prediction rate is still for protein binding residues much much higher than what we cross-predict uh, for the RNA binding residues. <clears throat> uh, um, since we use logistic regression, logistic regressions are really fast to apply. We not only actually benefit from the fact that we use logistic regression, we also benefit from the fact that our inputs, the profile that we generate, we've used specifically fast tools to produce that profile. When we uh, run alignments, we run alignments using uh, a faster tool, HHBlitz, against a very small database. We run a very quick single sequence predictions of solvent accessibility and secondary structure. Altogether, that uh, allows our model to be really quick. If we compare to the baseline um, runtime of other methods that all rely on Cyblast, um, our tool is in the order of three to four times faster. Um, so the line at the bottom is the computational runtime for our tool. It's in seconds, so you can predict a single sequence average size single sequence in about 20 seconds compared to a typical runtime for other tools, which is in minutes. <clears throat> so it's not only a little bit more precise, it's also a little bit faster in the order of three or four folds. So th these little numbers are essentially uh, the improvement fold. Um, since I have about, what, 30 seconds left or 20 seconds left, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this example. What I want to highlight is it's a, it's a reductase that binds both to a protein and to a small ligand, NADP. So here's the native annotation. You can see that binding residues can overlap, but they're also distinct. If you apply the best tool that is available right now for protein binding prediction, you can see that predicts pretty much all the binding residues. Then if we run uh, in a light blue the first layer from our predictor, which is nonspecific, we can pick up on pretty much the same residues, but we can nicely clean it up in a second line with the, the cross predictions can be cleaned up with the predictions of other binding residues. So that kind of a two layered approach does work. You can actually clean up, remove the cross predictions. And we have a web server, so if you ever interested in do protein protein docking or protein peptide docking and you would like to have some nice constraints for your method, uh, feel free to uh, visit our server. Uh, we allow you to run 10 sequences in, uh, as a batch. Um, if you have uh, larger demands, send me an email. We can uh, relax these constraints and we can run um, uh, larger predictions for you as well. And uh, with that, I'll leave um, a few of the conclusions on the slide and I'll take any questions that you may have in the remaining one minute that I have. <laughs> Thanks, that's uh, awesome. <laughs> um, the question that I had was, uh, you had some uh, threshold probably in structure for defining something as being in contact, right? The residues as being yes. binding. What was that threshold? Um, so um, it's a standard in the field. Uh, this, is, this is taken from, um, it's like an annotation database. Uh, it's essentially, if I remember correctly, it's uh, Van der Waals uh, radius of both um, uh, atoms that are used for annotation plus a constant. Okay, uh, what? That that's more or less translates into about three to four angstroms away. Okay, so, yeah. so then if you were to go right outside of your threshold, which is where I was heading, how much misprediction do you have around those? Um, and I anticipated that question. <laughs> um, and I have an extra slide for it, so I'm sorry. I'm going to bore you with one more slide. Uh, this actually shows you the sensitivity with respect to the distance in the sequence from the annotation. 
It's in a sequence, yes. But um, you know, residues immediately next in a sequence are going to be right on the cusp of that threshold. So what you see here is, uh, this is this is a blowout that goes over the entire range from zero to, to 300 residues. This is how far off our prediction could be from the nearest native. Uh, but this is the blowout of the first few positions away. So if you look at the one position away, you can see a big jump in sensitivity. These are probably native protein binding residues, which are just misannotated based on the fixed threshold. Um, so um, there's, there's, there's some more there to validate the quality of the method. And you can, you can argue that all these methods recognize that there's, 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 a, um, there's a visible uh, change in a, in, in a, in a in, in a curve at that point of one residue away. Yeah. Okay, we better move on to our next speaker, and thank you. Thank you.